Yeah. Just uh, about the unknown project. Um, I requested a test, but didn't hear back from you, so I didn't know. I will look at that tonight after okay. the uh, lecture. I just put out the stuff. I guess that was on Tuesday, so I should have checked it last night, but I did not check last night. So if you put in a test request, I haven't checked yet. My apologies. Anything else? No, thank you. All right. So if we look what we're doing today, I believe it's chapter six. And we are supposed to start chapter eight. I don't think we'll get there, but hopefully we will. Any questions about any of that? There is a lab tonight, so let me know at six o'clock in order to shut it down because <clears throat> I've got to start up at uh, 630 to do lab eight. All right, any questions about what we're doing? Hopefully I reminded you about uh, the quiz three last time. I noticed people were taking it, so hopefully that went over well. Um, there will be another quiz next week, and then our last quiz week, during week seven. I think I'll leave that for the lecture. All right, let me, uh, am I sharing my screen? Ah, guys. Oh, not yet. <laughs> nope. I was showing you my, uh, there you go, the schedule. So uh, we're going to be hopefully finishing week, uh, chapter six, and hopefully starting chapter eight. We'll see if we get there. All right. Um, I believe this is the slide we talked about last time. Is that correct? Anybody? Yeah, that looks, yeah, that's right. All right. So we'll start with, oh yeah, I'm gonna start here right there. I couldn't write it in the last slide because it, uh, the way that slide was, there was no place to write it. All right, um, so <clears throat> pure cultures is a culture that contains only one species. Uh, that concept was actually invented by Louis Pasteur, and he noted that to, to be able to study microbes, he had to work with a pure culture, and he developed a way of getting a pure culture. What, what, that wasn't very easy. Uh, later, uh, Dr. Koch invented an easier way of getting a pure culture. A colony is a population of cells arising from a single cell or a small group of attached cells or a spore or some other group of cells. Uh, when we streak it out on a plate and then get isolated colonies, we hope that each colony is derived from a single cell, but they may be derived from a small clump of cells. And therefore we call them colony forming units instead of the number of cells when we count the number of plates, uh, the, the number of colonies on a plate. And we say they're formed from a colony forming unit. To obtain single colonies, which is a critical part of obtaining a pure culture, you streak out a mixture of cells onto a plate to get isolated colonies. And we call that streaking for colony isolation. That greatly improves the, the chance that you'll have a pure culture. But if you want to ensure you have a pure culture, you take from an isolated colony and then streak it out from that isolated colonies on a second plate, getting isolated colonies a second time. And then you take from that second isolated colonies to start up your culture. And it is not 100% sure that that is a pure culture, but it will be greater than 95% sure. 
chance that it will be a pure culture because you've obtained it from two separate isolated colonies. Any question about any of that? So when you're streaking for colony isolation, let me see if I can enlarge this. What you do is you obtain a little bit of bacteria on your loop, which you don't want. Let's pretend this is a loop can you even see it? There it is. When I put it in my face, you can see it. Uh, it's actually an eraser and, uh, and a pencil. And you don't have a loop full. We're pretending this is a loop. You only have a very small, like one tenth of the loop full or even less. You just want a number of cells that you can see. And then you take it and streak it out on a plate in sector one. And there will be too many cells growing. Sorry, it's not sector one. Sector one's up here. There will be too many cells growing. And so we then sterilize the loop by putting it in the Bunsen burner or the Bacto incinerator, and then cool it, and then streak it on quadrant or sector two. And you go through sector one to pick up some cells. Normally you only pick it up, uh, streak it in three times, but this is streaking how many times? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. So that's a little bit more than you need. And what you wanna do is you don't grab from the high density portion of sector one, you grab from the lower density portion of sector one. The point is you pick up some cells in sector one, and then carry those cells to sector two. All right, and then you take your loop and put it through the flame or the Bacto incinerator to sterilize the loop. And then you pick up some cells from sector two. And this isn't shown well. Like I said, you wanna pick up cells about three times, not just once. And actually you start in sector three and you come back to sector two. Streak on sector three, come back to sector two. You do that about three times. Oops, didn't mean to go there. And that's to pick up some cells from sector two. You do not want to pick up cells where you have a very high concentration of cells from sector two. You want to have them where they're a little more dilute like this region here, okay? And then you streak out sector three. And the goal is uh, somewhere along the line, see, this looks like a little better. It actually went into sector two. One, two, maybe three times, maybe even four times right there. And then you streak out on the next quadrant and the idea is, is that when you're streaking, you're putting down cells, and then you're streaking here and you're putting down cells, and then you're streaking here and you're putting down cells, and the cells are getting less dilute each time you do a sector, and also from the start of the sector to the end of the sector, they're becoming less dilute. But there's a real big distinction between sector one and sector two, and sector three and sector two, in some place along the line, you're hoping to get isolated colonies put down. And in this case, isolated colonies are being put down in sector three. But in reality, uh, if you look, it looks like they were starting to be put down in sector two, but in sector three, we definitely have isolated colonies. And you want at least four isolated colonies on your streaking for colony isolation events. I hear we got much more than that. But you need to take from an isolated colony because if you were to take from this colony here, for example, you can clearly see that that's a mixed bag. There's red cells there and yellow cells there. So you take from an isolated colony and then you streak it out again 
And after you have two colony isolation events, we then say, all right, it's a greater than a 95% chance that you have a pure culture. Any questions about any of that? That works well when the colony, the cells of interest are large enough in the population to streak it out. For example, we had two cells here and we got isolated colonies from the red cells, but not isolated colonies from the yellow cells. Uh, that one's barely touching and that one's touching too. And this one's definitely touching. Any question about any of that? Uh, what you could do uh, if you wanted to isolate both red and yellow cells is you can grab from this colony here, but realize this is not an isolated colony. So you got to streak it out on one plate, get isolated colonies, hopefully only yellow ones, and then streak it out a second time because this is not an isolated colony. And then you can say it's greater than a 95% chance that it's a pure culture. Uh, the growth of bacterial cultures. Bacteria primarily grow by binary fission. That's where one cell splits into two and they split evenly. But there are a few bacteria that can grow by budding. Uh, yeast are more likely to grow by budding. But this is where a outpocket happens on the parent cell. And it's, we call that a bud. And that, and that bud enlarges. And it doesn't separate until the bud attains the size or close to it of the parent cell. There are also a few bacteria species that can reproduce by reproductive spores. Let me show you how a reproductive spore works. Sorry, I've got a whole bunch of windows open. And not the right one. On a reproductive spore, you usually have a long, skinny cell, which is going to be the parent cell. And it's usually pretty big compared to the reproductive spores. And then it grows up like that. And there could be another one down here, but that's not terribly important. The point is that this is the, the uh, parent cell, and it puts out reproductive spores. They will usually be on the tip. And there will usually be several of them. I'm not a good artist, but I'm trying to draw four of them. Oops, that one's going to be a little small. I'll make it a little rounded. Uh, they're on the tips so that if stiff breeze can carry them elsewhere or an animal or something like that, an insect more likely. And then the reproductive spore goes elsewhere and then germinates into a parent cell. There are only a few species which make reproductive spores. The point is that a reproductive spore, there's more than one of them. So when the parent cell is around, it makes more than one. And then we have five cells, so one cell, went into five, that is reproduction. Remember with an endospore, one cell, one parent cell makes one endospore and then the parent cell dies. So we get one cell and then one endospore, that is not reproduction. Endospores are a survival strategy. They are not a reproductive strategy. Reproductive spores are a reproductive strategy. Any question about any of that?
No, I'll keep that open in case I want that. All right, let's look at uh, binary fission a little in a little more detail. Are you guys hearing me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. You'll note that when I move my head, the thing will be a little bit blurry. It's because I don't have the green screen behind me, so it's not working as well. Um, I don't have the headphone on either, which I can get in a minute. Uh, anyways, binary fission is when one cell will elongate a little bit, and then it will divide its DNA, and then one copy of the chromosome will move towards this side of the cell, the other copy of the chromosome will move towards that side of the cell, and then the cell begins growing a cell wall and a cell membrane in between the cell, splitting the cell in two pretty evenly. And you can see in here an actual electron microscopic image of the cell membrane and the cell wall. And this cell is actually starting to divide this cell into two. And there's one copy of the DNA and the other copy of the DNA. And then that cell wall and the cell membrane grows and separates the cells. And then the one parent cell separates into two daughter cells. This is binary fission. Any questions about it? Budding is where one cell puts out a small bud and then it will divide its DNA and put it into the bud. And then that bud will grow and grow and grow until it becomes about the same size as the parent cell. And then it'll finally break off. Uh, this is showing you budding in yeast. Let's watch a little picture of that. Assuming I get it to go. I need to end this. Yeah. Not, not wrong one, sorry. Oh, it still hasn't gone yet. Mm. Let's scroll down here. So we're gonna watch this cell here and you can see it's pointed here. It's starting to put out a bud. And there you can clearly see the bud. And I wish this be down a little further. There we go, it may re replicated its DNA. Let me go back a bit. It replicating its DNA now. And the DNA is now it's moving into the bud. You can kind of see that. And the bud grows and grows. And now it's divided, separated from its parent cell. And there, this one forming a bud here, and that one's gonna start forming about there. Any questions about that? Anyways, that's bud formation in bacteria and similar in uh, yeast. You're actually seeing it in yeast. Any questions about any of that? I'm gonna go back one. All right. When we're talking about the growth of bacterial cultures, a term that's important is the generation time. The generation time is the time required for one cell to divide into two cells. And that's the same generation time for the population numbers to double. So if you got a thousand, it would double to 2000. Any question about any of that? The population doubling time varies considerably between different species of bacteria. The fastest bacteria have a doubling time of around 20 minutes. An E. coli has a doubling time that can be as fast as 20 minutes. Most bacteria that you work with in the lab, their doubling time is between 
one hours and three hours. But Mycobacterium leprae, the bacteria that causes leprosy, has a doubling time of 10 days. Why the Mycobacterium take longer to double is because they have mycolic acid in their cell wall. And it's a big molecule, and it takes time for the cell to make the mycolic acid and then put it in the cell wall. So, so the mycobacterium tend to grow slower than most other bacteria. Any question about any of that? Now, when I state that the doubling time is 20 minutes, you should understand that I mean the doubling time is 20 minutes per generation. Everyone got that? So when we're talking about the doubling time, we give it the number of minutes or a time unit per doubling. It's not something like 60 miles per hour where we give the number and then per time. This is the time per generation. And students often get that confused, what the doubling time is or the generation time, okay? Anyone know the generation time of the human population? Nobody knows? We're in a first world country, so uh, this isn't applicable to the United States, but I think the doubling time in the world is something like 19 to 23 years. And that's because of the quick uh, reproductive rate in, in something in the third world countries. Uh, the doubling time might be starting to slow. And then there's other factors which could kill off the population like uh, HIV and, and uh, COVID-19. <clears throat> I won't test you on knowing the doubling time of the human population. When microbiologists are talking about the generation time, they like to use semi-log plots. And it's actually not a log plot because the number of cells on the y-axis is a log scale. But the generations on the x-axis is a regular arith arithmetic scale. So this is a semi-log plot. And microbiologists like to use a log plot because when we use a log plot, we can separate out the points over here better. And then we can get the point here. The next one will be about here. And on the arithmetic scale, one cell divides into two, two cells into four, four cells into eight eight cells into 16, 16 into 32, meaning that we have a whole lot of plots right here. They're all together. And you can't plot them because you can't separate them. So that's a problem with the arithmetic scale. Another problem is the next point here, it's gonna be on the ceiling. So we spread out the points in the beginning and then we get one more point that we can put on the graph, then we could get with an arithmetic scale. But the real reason they like the semi-log plot is that the equation of the growth is much simpler. The equation of a semi-log plot is y equals mx plus b, this linear re relationship here. The equation for the arithmetic growth is something much more complex, something equal to y equals, let's go nx squared plus mx plus b. Okay. Any question about that? So microbiologists and biologists like to use a semi-log plot and it simplifies the math. And then we can plot more points down here and one more point on the graph here. When we're talking about the growth of bacterial cultures, and this is actually true of almost any 
biological species, but it's certainly true of microorganisms. We can plot the bacterial growth curve, and they're almost always what I'm going to show you. When you take a culture that's growing on solid media and then put it in a liquid culture, initially, when you inoculate the cells, there will be a lag phase where the cells are not growing. Why is there a lag phase? It's because the cells are making the enzymes they need to grow in the new liquid culture. And when they have those enzymes made, they can then grow. So that's the lag phase. Any question about that? The lag phase happens when you inoculate the cells till the point where the culture starts growing. We then get the uh, cells starting to grow and it enters exponential growth or logarithmic growth. Why does the cells grow quickly? Because there's lots of resources around initially, very few cells and lots of space, as well as the fact that the media is uh, very little waste because we just put the cells in there. So the media is nice and good. Let's see, anything else I want to talk about that? This is a log plot. And here we have the increase in the bacterial numbers with time. Uh, the cells do not stay in the log or exponential growth. They will begin to slow. So this will start bending. Any questions about that? Why does it slow? Well, because there are now more cells. So there's less space, there's less resources, and the wastes are beginning to generate. The cells are still growing because there's still nutrients around, but they're gonna start growing slower because there's less space, there's less nutrients, and there's more waste products around. They will slow to the point where the population stabilizes. And that's called the stationary phase. In the stationary phase, the population numbers stay about the same. Why they're staying the same is because the number of cells growing is equal to the number of cells dying. The lucky cells have some space around them. They have some nutrients around them. And they don't have that many wastes around them. So they're growing. The unlucky cells are not in such a good environment. They don't have much space. They don't have much nutrients around them. And they have lots of waste products. So they start dying. In the stationary phase, the number of cells growing is equal to the number of cells dying. And that keeps the population numbers the same. That can't continue. Uh, as that happens, eventually we'll enter the death or the logarithmic decline phase where the number of cells dying is greater than the number of cells growing. And that's because there's less space, there's more cells, less space, more waste products, and fewer nutrients around. Later on in the death or decline phase, we have no cells that are growing. There's only cells that are dying. How long that phase will take depends on the species. For some cells that are sensitive, like uh, uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, the dying will happen fairly quickly. On E. coli, uh, that will happen over a couple of days and then eventually all the cells will die. But if you have a species that produce endospores, this culture could be in the decline and death phase for, well, years, decades, millennia, centuries. Uh, I think the growth, uh, the longest, came out of uh, 
an ice pack in uh, Antarctica where they dug into the ice and it was something like, I don't remember exactly, but 40,000 or 100,000 years where there was an endospore surviving for that long of time. Now, admittedly, that was under frozen conditions. So that will encourage the, uh, the lifespan of the endospore. Eventually, the population will totally die. And if there's endospores, that could take a very long time. Any question about any of that? Even if there isn't endospores with the mycobacterium, uh, those cells can survive for at least a month in a harsh environment. Okay. All right, any question about any of that? If not, let's move on to the measurements of microbial growth. There are a number of methods to measure the growth of microbial populations. And I've done all of them except for one. I've done the plate counts, also called the viable plate counts, filtration. I have not done the most probable number. I've done a direct microscopic count, and these are all direct methods where you're directly counting the cells in some way or another. There's also indirect methods of counting. The turbidity meter, metabolic activity, and dry weight. I've done all of these for counting cells. The plate counts is one of the most common methods for a microbiologist to determine the number of cells in a sample, the number of bacteria, I should say, in a sample. We call it the viable plate count because only viable cells are counted. It measures the number of viable cells, and then we plate those out on a dish and then let them grow and incubate, and that viable cell will go on to form a colony. It does take more than 24 hours or more for the colonies to form. So you don't get your count immediately. Uh, the results are often reported as the number of colony forming units you have, because when we plate them out and we have an isolated colony that we count, we don't know did that colony form from one cell, two cells, or a small group of cells. So we count them and then say that's how many colony forming units there were in the original solution. To do the viable plate count, normally what you do is you make uh, serial dilutions and then inoculate a sample from each serial dilution. And then you count the colonies on the plates and you'll have more than one dilution, and you only count the one where you have colonies on the plate between 25 to 250 colonies. We'll explain why in a minute. And then you base your count on that. So if you had 25 colonies on the plate, and it was a one to 100 dilution, that would be 25 times 100, so 2,500 uh, colony forming units per mil of the sample that we measured. You can do a plate count using a bore plate or a spread plate method. Like I said, normally you do a dilution. You have your original inocula. Let's say you're, I don't know, testing uh, some culture of milk that's been left sitting out all day, and you put it into a beaker of media, and not a beaker, a, a test tube of media, where there's nine mils in it, and you put one mil of the sample in, this will be a dilution of one to 10. You then mix those cells, take one mil out of it, and put it into nine mils of media. That'll be a dilution now of one to 100, because it's one to 10 times one to 10, or one to 100. 
you mix those up, take one mil out, and you got your one to a thousand. And then you continue doing that for one to 10,000, one to a hundred thousand, maybe even one to a million. And then you take an aliquot from each of your dilution and you can pour it on and then swirl it or mix it uh, or rotate the plate is usually what we do. What you usually do is you have one mill, you put it on a plate, pretend this is a plate, and then you mix it around so that the liquid goes everywhere. And then you let the liquid absorb and the liquid has cells in it and they will form isolated colonies, which we'll show you later, but I'm sort of showing it there. You can also put on a smaller amount and then spread it with the spreader and then get that to grow up and form colonies. So that's the spread plate and that's the pour plate method. So we had our different dilutions and we plate each dilution. Only some of them will have plates where you can count them. Let me blow this up a little. Oops, too far. I can't get that to move down. All right. That'll be good enough. So on these two, we can count colonies. On this one, we couldn't count colonies accurately. On this one, there's no way to count colonies. That one, there's no way to count colonies. So what you do on these plates is you say too many to count or too numerous to count. We don't seem to have that here. And that's probably just because it's not showing. No, nope, it's not stating. Uh, too numerous to count, also too numerous to count. On this one, you can do the count there. And it looks like we'll get something like 30 counts. On this one, we'll get four or five counts. Where you want a count that is around 25 to 250. So we do our counts on this one here, not on the other one. The reason why I'm going to try and show you here, if I can get this to work. Because when we have, well, let's just say 200, and then we have plus or minus one, we're going to put in the minus there. That is plus or minus. I'm just going to go plus minus here. Oh, well, you know, I've got a minus there. Never mind. That should be uh, right there too. Come on. Ah, I lost control of that for some reason. Come on. All right, it's not doing it, so skip it. Oh, I know what the problem is. This thing's hiding me. That stupid Microsoft change what they do there. So let's go right there. Oh, that's too far. All right, this is becoming a little ridiculous. That's plus or minus 0.5%. Okay, that's a pretty small plus or minus. You can't even see the plus or minus there because of the blue. If we had four, let's do three. That one, well, let's do four, it'd be good. And then we have plus or minus one. I'm gonna go back, plus or minus. What the heck? Plus or minus one. That is plus or minus 25%. And that's why we don't use the small numbers to base our mean on because the mean isn't very accurate. If only one colony different, it's a plus or minus 25% if there's four. If you have 200 colonies and you're one colony off, it's only a plus or minus 
of 0.5%. Any questions about any of that? Well, where's my, there it is. That's why you count the colonies when there's 25 to 250 of them on the plate. And something that's less than that, you don't count it. Anyways, uh, the cells being plated go on to form colonies. And that's why this method counts viable cells. If a dead cell gets plated right here, it won't go on to form a colony. So the plate count method is one of the few ways where we get a viable cell count. Okay, any question about that? The filtration method is similar. It's used when the bacterial numbers are very low in solution, and you can filter either a gas or a liquid, pass it through a filter, and then plate the filter on an auger dish, and then count up the number of colonies that grow. So the filtration method is just a special uh, plate count method. Any question about the filtration method? A direct way of counting cells. Another direct way of counting cells is to do a direct microscopic count. You have a special slide which has a grid on it and you count the cells under a box in the grid. Let me blow this up. So here we see one box in the grid and this grid right here has a specific volume, meaning this slide is designed so that each box here will be a specific volume. And normally they're set up so that the number of cells you count here, will you will multiply by a million from your sample. So if you're counting the number of cells in milk that's been left out for a day, then you take a microliter and you put the uh, cells right here and it gets sucked under the grid. Under this part of the grid, that volume will be one millionth uh, of a mil of your original sample. Any question about that? Anyways, you count the number of cells under the microscope and then you multiply that by a number, usually by a, a million. So what is there, something like 20 in this grill? So there will be 20 million per mil in the original sample. Uh, the disadvantage of uh, the direct microscopic count is if you have viable cells that move around, this cell can move over here, and these two cells can move over from here into there. And so it's hard to do the count if you have cells that are moving. It may be difficult to do the count if you have uh, large capsules as well. A disadvantage of doing the direct microscopic count is you can't tell is that cell viable or dead. All we can do is say that that's a cell. Any question about any of that? I suppose another disadvantage is, is that uh, for the poor smuck who has to do the counts, uh, this is a little bit of a eye strain, especially if you're doing large number of counts, like doing one wouldn't be that bad, but if you're doing large numbers, it would be a bit of eye strain. But it's done pretty quickly. You just get your cells, put it on the slide, do your count, and in less than a minute, you can know how many cells you have for a mill. Uh, the most probable number I'm not going to talk about, and I'm not going to quiz you on it, but if you're interested, you can do it, uh, read about it. All right, so that's the direct methods for counting the cells. There are also indirect methods for counting the cells. Uh, my favorite indirect way for counting the cells is to use uh, turbidity or turbidity meter. 
uh, what you do is you shine light through the media and then measure the amount of light in the uh, uh, turbidity media. And then you have the cells in the media and the cells will block the light coming through. So less light will come through and we can measure the absorbance of the light and look on a chart to determine the exact number of cells you have. This is an estimate, but it's a fairly accurate estimate. And what's easy about this is you just get your cells, put it in the turbidity meter, get your measurement, look it up in the chart, and that tells you how many cells you have. Uh, usually you have to have a chart that's already made. So somebody went with the media and then they did different um, dilutions of cells and that media. And then you just look on the chart. And if you don't have it exactly, you estimate because it'll be a, a, a linear chart. But the point is, it's very easy to get the, an estimate of the cell numbers this way. Any question about turbidity media? Okay. Another way you can get an estimate of the bacterial numbers is by metabolic activity. It assumes that all bacteria metabolic products accumulates in direct proportion to the number of bacteria present, meaning for more CO2 being produced and you're measuring the amount of CO2 produced, that more CO2 is made with more bacteria present. And what you do is you measure the amount of CO2 that's made and then compare it to a chart and then get your estimate for the number of cells. And this chart has to be made where somebody had different numbers of bacteria and then they measured the uh, amount of CO2 that was accumulating. And then you compare your number to that chart. Uh, it doesn't have to be CO2, it could be any other metabolic measurement, like you can measure the amount of acidity or the pH. And you're assuming that the amount of acid produced is in direct proportion to the number of bacteria present. Any question about any of that? Another way of getting indirect methods for an estimate of the counts for the indirect methods is to uh, get measure the dry weight. So you get your cells and they'll be in a liquid solution and you centrifuge them and then the cell sediment and then you pour off the liquid and then you let the cells dry. Usually you put them under a, uh, a vacuum or a, a gentle heating to increase the speed with which they dry. But you don't have to do that. You could just let them dry. I'm not sure how long it would take them, depending on how many cells you have. For most cells, they would dry in a day or two. And then you measure the dry weight of the cells. And you measure your dry weight. And the more weight you have, the more cells you have. And they do this when uh, methods are not uh, satisfactory, like when we're talking about filamentous bacteria or fungi, they often will measure them using the dry weight. Like I said, I've done all of these and they all work well. Uh, with the dry weight, once again, you've got to have a, you take your measurement and then you go look at a chart where somebody's measured the weight and tells you how many cells you have. So somebody has to generate that chart. All right, any questions about uh, estimating bacterial numbers? So that's the different indirect methods, turbidity, metabolic activity, and dry weight. All of them are an indirect method for making counts of the cells. For direct methods, we've got the 
plate count, also called the viable plate count, the filtration, the most probable number, and the direct microscopic count. I won't test you on the most probable number. All right, any questions about chapter six? If not, let's begin chapter eight. We'll just get started. Who do I have my thumb drive? Ah, crud. I don't. I suppose I should have looked before I did that. I don't think I have chapter eight there, but let me look. I do not. That's why I wanted my thumb drive. All right, as is normal, I give you a slide where I tell you the major goals and the rough lesson outline. So know the terms, what's a genome, a gene, genotype, phenotype, vertical and horizontal gene transfer, what's an operon, what's a promoter, what's an operator, what's a structural gene, what's crossing over, what's transformation, conjugation, and transduction. Be able to describe DNA replication, RNA transcription, and protein translation. And then lastly, understand the different types of mutation. I think that's in the, uh, the worksheet. Any questions about chapter eight? So we're gonna talk first about the structure and function of genetic material, and we'll move through that. You should come to know the terms, genetics, the study of what genes are, how they carry information, how that information is ex expressed, and how genes are replicated. Genes are a segment of DNA that encodes a functional product. A gene usually encodes a protein, but there are some genes that only encode RNA. And these are the tRNA genes and the ribosomal or rRNA genes. The other genes, most of them will code a messenger RNA, which will go on to make a protein. When we're looking at a chromosome, remember that's one molecule of DNA, it will be associated with proteins and a gene will be on one region of the DNA of the chromosome. And so this would be one region of the DNA that encodes for the first gene. And there we're looking at a map, looking at different genes found on the human X chromosome. Any question about any of that? So some more terms, the genome, all of the genetic material in a cell, or in our case, also an organism. We're studying microbes. Uh, the study of genomes is called genomics. Genotype is the genes of an organism. For example, an individual who has blue eyes will have the genotype lowercase b, lowercase b. The phenotype is the expression of those genes. And that would be for an individual who has blue eyes, the phenotype is blue eyes. Any question about that? Uh, for the phenotype that if you have brown eyes, your genotype is capital B, lowercase b, 
or two capital Bs, I mean, capital B, capital B. So the phenotype brown eyes, the genotype uh, capital B, lowercase b, or two capital Bs. Any question about that? The genotype codes for the phenotype. Now here we're looking at the chromosome from E. coli, which in E. coli it's usually one DNA molecule, which makes up the chromosome. There are proteins associated with the chromosome, but there are no histone proteins in uh, bacteria. In eukaryotes, we have histone proteins on the chromosome. And it's the main protein on the chromosome. When we're talking about DNA, we should know that it's a polymer of nucleotides. DNA has four nucleotides, and you can know the names as either adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine, or you can learn them as A, T, C, and G. Either way, DNA is a double helix, meaning that there's one strand of DNA which goes this way. The other strand of DNA goes that way. Hopefully you can see that. We can maybe do it with a pen. One strand goes this way. Oh, it's not showing. The other strand goes that way. Yeah, that way, kind of. There are proteins associated with the strand of DNA. So the chromosome is both DNA and protein. The DNA is held together in a covalent chemical bond. And how that's held together is by the sugar phosphate binding to sugar phosphate meaning the sugar phosphate backbone holds one strand of DNA together. The nucleotide bases, A, C, and G, do not hold a single strand of DNA together. They're off on the side, forming the steps of the uh, double helix when it, it makes the spiral staircase. Uh, the nucleotides only bind hydrogen bond to the other strand, meaning the double strand of DNA. You get two hydrogen bonds between A and T and three hydrogen bonds between C and G. And note the strands are anti-parallel. One strand runs this way, the other strand runs that way. Any question about any of that? If there's no questions, I think I'm gonna stop here. And I'll see you at 6.30 for the lab. Thank you. All right.